When I started researching this about three months ago, I never really got too much into the abduction scene, uh, only because just a whole lot of UFO stuff going on. Spending most of my career in law enforcement, I can tell you that through the National Crime uh, reporting system, which is done by the FBI, every month every crime that's committed, whether it's stealing somebody's bicycle or committing a murder, is reported by every police department, state, local, federal, in this country. Uh, these numbers may sound astounding, but I just checked them before I came here tonight to make sure that they were still up. In one year in the United States, there are approximately 250,000 people abducted or missing. In the world, 2.5 to 2.7 million people are abducted or missing. Now, to ease that number back, approximately 95% of these people are found. They are runaway children, which encompasses about 70% of that number. Spousal abuse, the guy that wants to see that the grass is greener on the other side, murder, uh, ransom, and just outright foolishness. 30,000 of that number every year are never found, ever. No man, woman, child, 30,000 is the number that disappear off the face of the earth every year. I went back to 1990. It's a lot of people, a lot of men, women, and children. Um, some of the abduction cases that I've read are truly unbelievable, at the same time fascinating. I'm going to talk tonight about one of the cases in Pennsylvania that is probably so strange that every time I read it, I come up with a different answer. My forte in law enforcement was homicide investigation. So uh, I know what I'm reading. In 2002, August 6th to be exact, a gentleman by the name of Todd Cease was abducted. And the headline read, Todd Cease was abducted and murdered by aliens on Montour Ridge in Northumberland County, Pennsylvania. Todd Cease, a 39-year-old white male, lived at the base of Montour Ridge in, Mon in uh, Northumberland County, married, father of two, two boys. Uh, got dressed one morning early and jumped on his ATV and decided he was going to take a ride up to Montour Ridge to spot early season deer. Told his wife he would be back by noon. Noon came and went. Two o'clock, his wife notified the police department. Search team was organized immediately. Um, they found his four-wheeler at the top of the ridge. They had cadaver dogs and search dogs, state police. Um, approximately 200 volunteers all together. They had uh, divers go into the pond on his, on his property, dive the pond, search the bottom of the pond. The uh, pond is located about 25 yards from the house. Um, the only thing they did find was one of Todd Cease's shoes, about 78 feet in the air in a tree. Uh, police questioned course, people in the area, and it's kind of a rural farming community, so it's like, you know, a couple of living places where people really have real homes, and there's like six farms and a home. And uh, some farmers at a farm two miles away from the residence said that they saw what they believed to be a tube-shaped object above the tree line and power line, and a beam projecting down from it, and something being lifted up into the craft. They couldn't describe what it was. Um, the search continued throughout the day. They searched six square miles of Montour Ridge. All they found was the ATV and Mr. Cease's one boot in the tree. They called it a night, started all over the next morning, and later on in the afternoon, in a thicket of bushes 25 yards away from the house at the pond, somebody sees something white. Now, these people have been marching past this site for almost two days. 
30 some hours. Nobody has seen anything in that area. But at this time, they see something white. Firemen, of course, start digging into it. It's very heavy brush. They've got to cut into it with axes and power tools. And they finally find Todd Cease. Todd Cease is in his underwear. He is pale white. He's emaciated. Remember, this takes place in August. Had he been out there for the time of death, which the coroner ruled at 36 hours, he would have been bloated beyond belief. There was no liver mortis, no rigor mortis on the body, nothing but a few scratches from the bramble bushes in which he was entangled. Three feet away from his body was that of a dead rattlesnake, same time of death. Uh, Mr. Cease was not bitten by the rattlesnake. The body was described by people at the scene as his hands were up like this, and he had a look of horror on his face. He also had one inch and a half or one centimeter burn mark on his left temple. The body was removed without a coroner on the scene. Pennsylvania law requires that if your head is laying over there and your body is laying over there, I, as a police officer, cannot pronounce you dead. I have to have a coroner. That is law. Nobody can pronounce you dead but a coroner, no matter how many pieces you came in. The body was removed uh, to uh, Fort Indian Town Gap. Nobody from the family was allowed to view the body, and nobody viewed the body even after, before it was interred. Point Township has about a six-man police department. Their statement after all this took place was that Todd Cease's um, information on how he died would be forthcoming in about six to eight weeks, and that's when the people could have the body back, the family. Toxicology had to take place. They wanted to know what was in the blood, what happened. Was there any foul play, which they kind of ruled out? Seven and a half weeks later, the toxicology results come back. Todd Cease died of a cocaine overdose. I've seen a lot of cocaine overdoses. Never seen one where the guy threw his shoe up in a tree and there were no footprints around his vehicle, like when he got off his vehicle to wherever he went. There was always a coroner on the scene. So with all that in mind, we tried a Freedom of Information Act report request from the police department. We were told it's still an open case. My question to the sergeant that day was, if it's still an open case, why did you say that he died of a cocaine overdose? Isn't that the cause of death? Yes, he replied. I said, if that's the cause of death, then the case is closed. No, it's not. And then he threatened to have me arrested for harassment. Good luck. The Todd C's case with Pennsylvania MUFON is an open case. Uh, myself and another investigator from another group are looking into the case as best we can, and we try to keep up with the police as best we can. Do I think he died of a cocaine overdose? Nah, not even close. Cocaine overdose doesn't leave a burn mark on your temple. Cocaine overdose does not make you disappear for 36 to 40 hours. And I find it very hard to believe that 200 searchers with dogs and cadaver dogs walked past this body for two days and didn't see it. So is this one of our abductees? Now the dark side. He's early 90s. The, cat, the, the mutilations were all the same. The eyes are removed, parts of the jaws are removed, ear, inner ears are removed, tongue, inner throat removed, uh, anal area cored out, 
sexual organs removed, and some intestinal and respiratory organs also removed. In 1956, we got the first report of a human victim, the same type of mutilation. It was Master Sergeant Lovett, United States Air Force, stationed at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. And he, um, along with his colonel, went downrange to pick up some missile parts from a shot that they had that morning. The colonel's on one side of a little sand mound, and sergeant's on the other side, and the colonel hears the sergeant screaming, so he runs up over the sand dune in time to see the sergeant being drug off by his leg with something like a cable wrapped around his leg and being pulled into a saucer-type ship. The colonel immediately jumps back in his jeep, heads back to headquarters, tells him what happened, and he immediately placed him under arrest for murder. Three days later, Lovett's body shows up. 415 feet from the exact spot where he was taken from the exact drag marks. The body is identical to the mutilation of a cow. Everything is missing, just like cow, cattle, that have been reported since the early 50s. In 1988, this most disturbing case came to light. It takes place, it was taken, had taken place in Brazil at the Guaraparanga Dam, which is a dam that supplies water. It's a man-made dam, supplies water right outside of Sao Paulo. Um, some fishermen are out on a, in a boat, three guys in a boat, just doing a little fishing. And they look toward the shore, and they see what they think is a corpse. So instead of checking it out, they hightail it back and get the police. Uh, police show up, they take one look, they call forensics, and the forensic team arrives. The gentleman is done in just like Sergeant Lovett. Eyes removed, partial jaw, tongue, inner throat, inner ear. He has the same one centimeter puncture wounds on his chest, which remove lymph nodes, bicep, which removes bicep muscle, navel, which removes intestines. Internal, internal organs, uh, sexual organs removed, uh, anal area cord out, just like cattle. And uh, the body's remarkable. Again, no postal libidity, no liver mortis, no rigor mortis. Got to remember, when Todd Cease disappeared and laid up in that August heat, he should have been as bloated as a, a bus. This guy was laying for 40 hours. He should have been immense. The body was remarkable as far as an investigator is concerned. The, uh, in all cases that I'm talking about here, the carcasses show no blood. The blood has been drained from the carcass, whether human or cattle. All the sensory organs are missing. And from what is gathered from the autopsies, it's some type of a sucking device that has some sort of a laser tip that makes the hole, cauterizes the wound, and then does whatever it does. I was fortunate enough to get the autopsy report from this case. I also have the pictures of the body. Um, People often ask, why don't I put it up there? Yeah, you don't want to see these, unless you've got a real strong stomach. Um, the autopsy report keeps mentioning, of course it mentions all the wounds and what's missing, but also it keeps mentioning two words, vital reaction. Anybody here know what vital reaction is? If I stab a dead person, all I'm going to get is a wound, an open wound. Nothing else. No black and blue, no tearing, no bleeding, nothing. Just, thing, just an open cut. If I stab a live person, there's a movement. There's a vital reaction. Now I've got bruising, I've got tearing, Inside, outside, okay? 
In 17 sentences in this autopsy report, it mentions the victim has suffered from vital reaction. This guy was alive. In 17 sentences in this autopsy report, it mentions the victim has suffered from vital reaction. This guy was alive. The um, disturbing thought of being butchered alive is very hard to comprehend. The true test of the vital reaction is to remove the skull cap during an autopsy. When the skull cap is removed, and the brain is exposed, a vital reaction to a forensic scientist or a doctor, you would see a hematoma on a blood vessel. Not big, just a burst. Okay? That's the body's reaction to pain. So if you roll somebody over and you whack them on the back of the head and they go unconscious, probably not. They're just going to have a hematoma, and they're going to have a headache. If you roll somebody over with a steamroller very slowly, inch at a time, foot at a time, the brain just goes haywire. The brain can't handle that kind of pain, and the person passes out, which is a good thing. This guy's skull, was his brain was covered with them. From front to back, all lobe areas were covered with hematomas. This gentleman was alive when this took place. Then I came upon a case uh, which was a horse that was found in Colorado. But when, the, when eyes are removed, you have a vis viscous type of fluid that flows. Not blood, it's just fluid behind the eyes. The investigator's standing there, and he's looking at this horse's face, and he's just staring and staring and staring, and he finally comes to the conclusion that, wait a minute. If the eyes were removed and the horse was on his side, the visceral fluid would have went this way. But instead, the visceral fluid went right down his snout, over his lip to his missing jaw. That horse was alive. He was standing up. <clears throat> Dr. Lear... Sure, you've heard of Dr. Lear, the guy that finds all the little transmitters and stuff under people's skin. Um, mentioned some cases in L.A. and California that he was involved in early on in his career, which got him really involved in the UFO phenomenon and abduction and what he studies now, which is the placing of radio, act, or radio transmitters in people. Um, thought for years that cattle's, cattle work wasn't the only thing that was being mutilated out there. There's a couple more quick cases that I found. Can't get a whole lot of information on them, but I'm trying. There was a case in uh, 2005 is the latest, and that took place in Egypt, um, Beni Mazar region of Cairo, where three families, men, women, and children, were all found murdered and mutilated in the same fashion. Youngest being three years old, oldest being 47 years old. The local police were quick to blame it on a retarded man who lived 200 miles away and had no way of getting to that scene. He's paraplegic. But when you gotta come up with somebody, just come up with somebody. Then there's two cases that come out of the Vietnam era, and there was enough horror to come out of the Vietnam era to last a lifetime. One just came to light where a United States Naval combat photographer was assigned to the base at Da Nang and was called to go along with a rescue team to check out the crash of a B-52. The they got on the scene, and the photographer noted that the plane didn't crash. It looked like it was placed in the jungle. 
There was no damage to the wings. Nothing was tore off. It wasn't all, it wasn't all banged up. No fire. It just looked like it was just set down in, in the bush. Upon entering the plane, check for survivors. All five crew members were found strapped in their seats, mutilated, just like cattle. The report went back to their headquarters in Da Nang, who sent out a MAXOG unit, which quickly white phosphorus the whole plane and burned it to the ground. That team was taken back to uh, Da Nang, and they were interrogated uh, with the use of sodium pentothal. This happened a long time ago. This guy just remembered it a couple months ago. So I'm sure we're going to hear from other people that were on that team. And another case that was <laughs> remarkable <clears throat> was um, a uh, black ops unit it was operating in Cambodia. They're coming down the Kokoda Trail, or what they called the Kokoda Trail which did not exist in Vietnam, by the way. Uh, and they came upon eight aliens, who they described as small gray creatures, loading body parts from a firefight into small containers. The second firefight broke out. We won. They lost. The bodies of the aliens and the body parts from the firefight were all recovered. And that's the last we ever heard of it, and that's the last anybody will ever hear of it. The government took over. Does the government believe in abduction? Absolutely not. People who have been abducted are just losing their mind. I've read some pretty credible cases, and I've talked to some pretty credible people. Am I a believer? Absolutely. Do I feel that they're out there for more than one purpose? Look, if they're going to experiment on us, they've been here for what, thousands of years? Do you think they would have done it by now? What are they doing now? We know they're here. We want to know why they're here. What's their purpose? Why are we losing 30,000 people a year? Why are people with abduction shunned? In ufology, you know, if you follow Jesus the Cadillac, abductions of the Chevy. Nobody really wants to know. They don't want to know about the Paranga case. They don't want to know about any cases in Vietnam or people being mutilated in Egypt. But it gets even better. We have a case in Colorado, very recent. And this investigator ain't letting go. He's also an ex-police officer and a MUFON chief investigator. He's called the scene of a car accident. MUFON does not go to car accidents. I've done enough of those. He gets there and the police officer says, we can't find the body. But somebody said that they saw something over the hill here and it looked like a UFO and that's why we called you. So old Joe the investigator trots up over the hill and he finds the body. Mutilated. 19 year old victim. Identical to every case that we've seen so far. How many people here believe in abduction? It's true. It does. It happens. It has happened. The Totsi's case, we're not going to let go of it. That old sergeant up there who thought he was going to have me arrested for harassment, he just bit off more than he can chew. <clears throat> uh, we will find out what happened to Totsi's. I've been contacted by the family. They're backing me up 100%. First they didn't. First time they, back, first time they called me, uh, they threatened me with a lawsuit, I don't know, shooting my dogs, uh, whatever. They just went berserk. But uh, we will find out what happened. And uh, the human mutilation, after reading these cases and looking into some of this stuff and coming up with some of this stuff, you know, if you see something flying up there and it's close, run like hell. Don't call me. Don't think about anything. Just get out of there. Just go. Because I have no idea what they want. 
can't be experimenting. I mean, we're not that, we're not that sophisticated that it takes 2,000 years to investigate one of us or experiment on us. There, there are many cases that are just shoved aside or ignored. If you're investigators out there or, you're, or you have an interest in this phenomenon, uh, and I got this from Peter Robbins and I, I found it to be a very, very true statement. If you want to know about all this stuff, you need to have your own library. Build your own library. Get the books on abduction. There's tons of them out there, written by really great investigators. John Mack, Jacobs. I mean, there's a ton of them. They'll give you all the information you need, which will take you to this, the Internet, which is loaded with information. You just got to know where to find it. So you've got to think outside the box. Don't think abduction like the light comes through the window and the body gets off the bed and out the window it goes and it comes back three hours later. There are many types of abductions. The ones that concern me the most are the 30,000 abductions. Those are the ones I'm concerned about. I can't imagine 30,000 people a year just vanishing. And when I say vanishing, I mean no trace at all. No bodies. No whereabouts, no contacts, nothing. They're gone, like they never existed. And part that bothers me the most about that is the children. They don't really have a whole voice or a lot to say about anything anymore. Um, there are not that many cases in Pennsylvania that we've encountered with abduction. And I think the reason of that being most people are distrusting. You know, somebody's going to tell me something, I'm going to call the newspaper. Not happening. I am not a real newspaper guy. Matter of fact, I've been dead three times because of newspapers. They don't get anything right. I would never turn over anything to a newspaper. We have a contact us section on our homepage, which is www.pamufon.com. Last page says contact us. You put something in there that you need me to look at, or you want me to look at, or you want to tell me about, that comes direct to me. It goes to nobody else. My number, my website, and the, my personal email address is right there. You can get me in a matter of minutes, and you'll get a call back very shortly. The abduction phenomenon is getting stronger, larger, all the time. There seems to be no let up. Worldwide, like I said, 2.5 million people a year. What about all the countries that don't report those statistics, like Zambia, Angola, all those third world countries that they don't report anything? So how many more people do we add? I did a statistical check to see on the percentage of change year to year since 1990. Uh, high points of abduction were 91, 95, 2001. On average, you get a 1 to 2 percent increase every year or decrease, one way or the other. In those specific years, you had a 10, 12, and a 14 percent increase. So now what we need to do is we need to go back and look at the UFO sightings in those areas for those years and see if they increased. It's the only way we can put this together. But like I said, you see one?